Hi, I'm Keith Loiso, University Architect at Vanderbilt, and I wanted to welcome everyone to this is the third session for Making Nashville Living Building Ready. And um, this will be followed. The next session will actually be a site visit to the Candida Building at Georgia Tech in, on April 6th. So if folks have not gotten on the mailing list, there is a sign-up sheet out front. But um, we started investigating living buildings really uh, as part of our future VU efforts. And uh, we're very fortunate that Vice Chancellor Eric Kotstein is here to uh, speak a little bit about those efforts, which, have, which is of course based on our academic strategic plan, but then has led to other initiatives. So Eric, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks Keith for having me. And thank you to everybody in the audience for coming out today. It's getting a little warmer outside. I have just a few slides, and I'm, I'm going to try to go really, really quickly because I want to turn the podium over to our colleagues here who will be much more interesting um, than me, um, I'm sure. But I wanted to kind of root what we're talking about here in terms of living buildings and the broader contours of our future VU plan, which is our campus land use plan. So I'm not going to read these out loud, but I will say this is one of the off-the-cusp uh, remarks that our Chancellor Nick Zeppos made early on in our process of developing the future VU plan. It's one of his inimitable quotes that just come off of his uh, rolls, roll off his tongue, and it made its way onto this slide. There's also a nice quote from Cesar Pelli, who we had the um, honor of working with on this plan from his short um, and really lovely essay, Thoughts on American Campuses. I would encourage you all to Google that. It's about an eight-page read and well worth your time. But in essence, what we're really talking about here with Future VU is a blueprint for the future of the campus, for the buildings, for the landscapes, for the places, all tethered to and in support of our academic strategic plan, which is all about teaching, research, innovation, and discovery. This is a slide of contrast that I like to show. Here's a timeless, beautiful building on the Vanderbilt campus. Here's a sacred landscape shown in contrast to a return on investment dri uh, driven development downtown, an office building. Um, I hope there's no architects who designed that building uh, in the room tonight. It's a fine building, but maybe it's sold once or twice. This, filled in, this, this uh, photograph is about two or three years old, um, and I wouldn't exactly call this uh, timeless in comparison to this kind of architecture, and I wouldn't compare this landscape, which is the northern border of our campus, West End Avenue, as sacred uh, in the same way here. So Vanderbilt, as an institution, takes a very long view on things. We think in terms of decades and centuries. We will be here. We're not moving to Kentucky because there's cheap land. We're not going to Ireland for tax breaks. We're here for the long haul, and our trajectory and the trajectory of this city are inextricably intertwined. And as stewards of the institution, I feel like we're fortunate to have the capability, but also I feel really strongly that we have the responsibility as stewards to take that long view and insist on quality products, on beautiful places, on beautiful buildings. Our future VU plan is guided by principles. We always like to say what is true north for our aspirations here. And we spent probably our first year of planning, not taking out the big maps and going, what should go where, and where's the next res college, or where does the science building go, but rather engaging our community across Vanderbilt, really across many aspects of the entirety of the Nashville community to come up with these guiding principles against which we can judge the veracity of concepts for our campus. And again, I won't read these, but you'll see some of the words, diversity and inclusion, a community of neighborhoods, a vigorous campus, a distinctive park-like setting. I like to say one of the most obvious tenets of strategy is to know what differentiates your product and then really double down on that. And we are fortunate to have much of our campus being a park-like setting. Much of our campus is a parking-like setting. And that kind of collides uh, with these values. Walkable and sustainable, right on the front there. And then a citizen of Nashville and the region. 
This is a conceptual overview of how we've organized our efforts. We have many things moving along on undergraduate residential colleges. Um, all you have to do is travel down West End Avenue to see that. We are aspiring to create our first dedicated and affordable graduate and professional student housing to be delivered in the first wave in 2021. We have a variety of studies underway around our arts and humanities spaces, our science spaces, our Vanderbilt child and family um, centers, and many other things. We have a well-articulated real estate strategy, and for those who follow the newspapers closely, you know that Vanderbilt has been active in the real estate market for a variety of good reasons. And then these four elements are really cross-cutting, and I think we've made a lot of progress with Keith and the team in really accomplishing what I call integrated planning to make sure that we're thinking about all these things holistically with those guiding principles in mind every time that we do a project. Um, sustainability and environment are a really, really important part of the plan to demonstrate that this is a very high-level graphic where we've been kind of opining on what would it take for Vanderbilt to, for instance, become carbon neutral by 2050? And how can we even potentially go beyond that? And I'm not going to get into all these different measures, but we are moving forward forcefully on pursuing all of these different topics. And I think with that in mind, as we started to talk about living buildings, and we started to hear about the Candida building, and we met Jason McLennan and brought him to campus and have had other great dialogues, I've personally become really, really excited about the prospects of Vanderbilt being the first campus in Tennessee to have a living building. Um, you can see we have a lot of aspirations, but in my mind, aspirations are really only ideas until they become accomplishments. So I appreciate all that the teams are doing here to work together to socialize these really, really important topics. And thank you again for all being here. And with that, I'll turn it over. Yes, thank you, Eric. Um, there's a local chapter of the Living Building Collaborative, and Kim Shen is heading that up. Kim, I know there's an event that's coming up. Can you mention that? that? Um, the International Living Future Institute, the folks behind the Living Building Challenge, have a couple of conferences each year. One is the Living Future Unconference, which is always up in the far upper left-hand corner of the United States. Uh, so it's a long, long way to get there. But in the last couple of years, they've created something called the Living Product Expo. And uh, it's especially appropriate that given um, what we're going to be talking about today, the materiality part of the Living Building Challenge, the Living Product Expo is actually a place where you can uh, come and touch and talk to the people who build and manufacture and provide the products that go into Living Building Challenge buildings. And the ILFI's vision for the Living Product Expo is that unlike the Living Future uh, Unconference, that it will travel around. Uh, last year's conference was in Pittsburgh, uh, and they have decided to come to Nashville. Uh, and they will be here in April, um, I believe early in April. Anybody remember the, the dates? The, no, the, the expo itself. Uh, that's right. Yeah, October 7th through the 10th. Um, so this is an opportunity for those of us who are in the southeast to, to make a, a visit to and uh, see this, this exposition. Uh, we're, as uh, I was saying, talking about uh, getting more involved with the local collaborative uh, to get uh, some local events, showcase our city and the region to the folks who will be coming from around the world to attend the Living Product Expo. So if, if you've got great ideas for a shoulder event, uh, I've already uh, advocated a distillery crawl. Um, if you can think of things that would be uh, fun events for the visitors that uh, come to the, the LPE to get involved with, uh, see either myself or, or Paul or Keith 
and uh, give us your ideas. Thank you, Kim. Also, uh, tonight I wanted to thank Sesco Lighting for providing the, uh, the reception. So after this series, we're going to all meet and have a discussion out in the lobby. And also I wanted to introduce Maya Alexander. Maya is on a, on a senior project team that is developing a living building on campus as a senior project. And she's going to introduce our speakers tonight. Okay. Our first speaker tonight will be Larry Ford. He is an American Institute of Architects fellow, a lead advanced professional, as well as a client advocate, fiscal realist, and strategic planner. Larry Ford is a thought leader in sustainable and regenerative design. His interest was peaked in the late 1970s when he led the design of the Georgia Power headquarters uh, in Atlanta with the mission of creating the most energy conservative high-rise office building of its time. In 1982, the 750,000 square foot building achieved that recognition. Larry has influenced successful outcomes through strategic facilities planning, feasibility studies, program development, and design to achieve successful results. One of the cornerstones of his leadership has moved to finding innovative solutions to complex challenges, including regenerative approaches to energy, water stewardship, or waste prevention in the buildings, as well as to maximize positive social impact. Larry's insight and experience emanates from his recognition that it takes collaboration amongst many levels of the client organization, the designers, constructors, vendors, material manufacturers, and code officials to achieve success. Our second speaker, Joshua Gassman, is the Sustainable Design Director at Lord X Sargent. For nearly 20 years, Joshua has led large, multifaceted design teams focused on sustainable design. During his career, he has managed a broad spectrum of projects, ranging from large research labs for major universities to interpretive and educational facilities. His work extensively on projects in involving challenging sustainable criteria, including net positive water and energy, most recently, he has been the design team lead for the Candida Building at Georgia Tech. He holds degrees from Washington University in St. Louis and Arizona State University. Larry, if you're ready. Thank you, Maya. Good evening. It's good to have you here. It takes a, a village to uh, create a successful project in any context, but it takes more than that a real le high level of collaboration amongst people to, uh, to get a living building done. And Professor uh, Gassman over here will talk to you about that in just a minute. But uh, Nashville is incredible. You, it, it, we talk about Atlanta, we're from Atlanta, but I was just reading uh, Rolling Stone's latest edition, Nashville Now. And I, I love one of the quotes down here uh, uh, that, that's in there, it says, my Nashville, it feels like lightning can strike at any moment. That's the beauty of this place. So uh, tonight we are uh, uh, here to, to talk about uh, things, but for those that are architects, is that if you uh, give us your uh, information, we can uh, get you uh, your CEU credits. But I won't read all that, thank you. <laughs> is that the first two uh, meetings were, was talking about uh, energy, net positive energy, and net positive water. And both of those uh, are both uh, challenging pieces. Tonight, we're gonna, uh, Joshua's gonna talk about the materials piece of that. Uh, but uh, we, uh, you know, there are seven pedals, and we'll go through, he'll also mention a little bit about that. But it's obvious that, uh, that the whole idea is to go from just code minimums to something that's sustainable at least, and then at another level, a regenerative. And we've all been talking about that for a long time, but it, it is beginning to happen with great people like, uh, like Keith and Eric uh, sponsoring a, a program that, uh, that perhaps will lead to a, a living building project here at, at Vanderbilt to set the standard or to set an example for everybody here in Nashville. The, uh, it, it, is, it is not a solo effort. You, you can't do it by yourself. It, it takes a, a, a great client, 
but then it takes a, 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 a team. Uh, in, in the case of the Georgia Tech project, it was funded uh, $30 million by the Candida Fund. And then it takes a place to do it at Georgia Tech and their commitment. And then a whole team of people, and then constructors, uh, vendors, manufacturers, code officials, and other people that help you support the achievement of that. The code officials are the ones that are, that are really playing catch up. Are there any code officials in here? No, not one, but anyway, we need to get them in these meetings as well to learn about uh, how to make those kinds of transitions. So anyway, tonight we'll talk about uh, the materials pedal, but this is the basic uh, 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 mission statement for the Living Building Challenge. Y'all can read it, and uh, then I'll turn it over to Professor Gassman. The reason I'm saying Professor Gassman is that he t uh, went with Keith today to teach or to talk about this project at their, their class that Keith mentioned earlier. Joshua. Thank you, Larry. All right. I think when I come to a university and I'm double fisting it, this is probably not what I had in mind. But that's <laughs> so um, uh, when we talked about the energy pedal when we were here, um, well, a couple of months ago, maybe give or take, um, we talked a little bit about energy and what it took to get to net positive energy. This was sort of where we ended that discussion in terms of how much energy we were generating on the site and <clears throat> how we were getting there. And so. Um, for those of you interested in geeking out about this, we can certainly talk a little bit more about exactly how we got there in, in sidebar conversations. But um, the gist of it is we're net positive energy by quite a bit. We're generating quite a bit of energy. Um, and then the last time we were here, we talked quite extensively about site and about water, about how site and water come together, about the strategies that we've adopted on the Candida, on the Candida building to get to net positive water. Um, and then this is sort of that same information into diagram form for those of you that are slightly more, more visual. And so you can see we're effectively capturing water off the roof and then we're drinking it and we're using composting toilets as a, as a way to treat our black water and then we're treating our gray water on site and infiltrating that. Um, again, as, as folks who were here before know, this is a subject of a two hour talk. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of where we were. So today uh, we're gonna focus on um, this is the the list of seven pedals from the Living Building Challenge. We're going to focus today primarily on, not those three, oops. Um, we're going to focus primarily today on materials and the materials pedal. <laughs> so that's, the, that's that one. There we go. Um, so uh, you can see the materials pedal, unlike energy and water, is actually made up of multiple imperatives. And I'm going to go through each of those imperatives. Uh, they each have different requirements and different implications in terms of selection of products that we're building a building out of. So we need to be holistic as we think, but then we have to drill down enough with each of our selections to make sure that we're focusing on each of these uh, pieces of the puzzle. Um, again, the Living Building Challenge, like all the pedals, is based on results, right? We're not interested in modeled performance or in what we've specified in the case of materials. We're interested in what actually goes into the building, and so we need to keep track of that in conjunction with our contractor throughout the entire process. And that is, um, in the case of the materials pedal, quite an extensive act and takes a lot of paperwork, although we can talk a little bit more about how hard it is, hard in terms of a lot of labor, yes, um, hard in terms of the problems are unsolvable, no. And so it depends on how you, how you start to look at those things. Um, this is really important. This is sort of the overarching idea for everything about this project, right? We are building what, in my mind, is a five-dimensional puzzle. And any time you push on any one piece of that puzzle, my hand gestures don't work with double fisting, um, then you push over here, and then three other things pop out over here. So when you try to fix those pieces of the puzzle, you push them back in, and then three different things pop out over here. And you're going back and forth and back and forth until you get to the point where you have a holistic design that understands water and energy and materials and equity and place and wraps it all together in a, in a whole. And so that's really, really important as we start to think about this. And so while today we're focusing on materials, we always have to run everything through all these filters at the holistic level. Um, just a quick sort of overview of what the project is. Uh, the project sits on about an eight-acre site. 
uh, let's see, that's the pointer, uh, sits on an eight acre site. Right now, this is all asphalt parking lot, but the idea is that in the future, that in the very near future, that will be um, a passive recreation and stormwater management area uh, in terms of the, the campus scale at Georgia Tech. And our building here, this is an existing street that we have closed and converted into a pedestrian walkway along the western edge of the building. And the idea is that we have porous pieces of the program here that enter into an atrium and then a fairly solid piece of program across the eastern side. And you'll see that in a second. So here we are in a rendered site plan view from that diagram. And the site does a couple of things which are really fun. Uh, one of which is it slopes down as you go up, which is north. Um, and then the other piece is that it faces west. And so we were very interested in this land site building connection and really tying them together. And so while conventional wisdom says, especially for high performing buildings, you probably want to avoid a western facing building, we chose to do that because there were other design uh, imperatives that, that drove us to, to do that, and then we had to solve that problem uh, in another way. And I talked a little bit about that when I did the, uh, the energy talk. Um, quick rendering of the southern facade. You can see here how the PV array sticks out. This is part of our shading device that we're creating on the west, as well as generating energy, as well as creating a beautiful space here that's a transition and rain shelter for people as they walk along that western edge. Quick rendering of inside the building. And we'll talk uh, a little bit more in a minute about the level of, um, of wood and why there's wood in the building uh, and why wood was a, a really important choice in terms of building the building. Uh, this is from the second level of the atrium looking out across the, towards the classrooms on the west. Uh, and then a, a quick scale drawing just so you can understand the extent of the photovoltaic array. Here, this is where the street used to be on the site, Dalny, which is now an ADA compliant path that moves you up that hill. Uh, and then a quick rendering of the western facade. Um, some key metrics for this, um, for those of you that are, that are interested, I think that the big takeaway from this is one of Georgia Tech and Candida's missions here was to build a living building for what is a conventional price point on the Georgia Tech campus. It was really important that, you know, I say this slightly in jest, but slightly uh, literally, that if you have $1,200 a square foot, you can build almost anything you want and you can achieve a lot of goals. But if you're constrained by market conditions, in this case, the between three and, and $400 a square foot range, then you have to really solve these problems in ways that don't require throwing money at them. And so that's really important. And again, that's, that's why I called it a five-dimensional problem, because the, the cost is that fifth dimension. Um, so we're going to dive into the materials pedal. Um, at the, at the high level, one of the things that, um, that, that we see is that a lot of universities, as they start to look at this, have unique challenges that aren't necessarily faced by other building owners uh, when they start to look at the materials pedal. So one of them has to do with the duration of the building. Eric talked about uh, being stewards of the land and stewards of the building. So we're talking about buildings that are designed to last 100, 200 plus years. And what that means in terms of material choice and what it means when we're trying to get certain materials that are hazardous out of a building and we're asking for new chemistry in certain things like waterproofing membranes, but those new chemistries may not have been around for very long. So there's a balance between red lists sometimes and, and longevity. Um, uh, some universities, Vanderbilt, will not necessarily face this particular challenge, but um, public procurement processes and the way specifications are written, and if you have to pick three of one kind of material, that can be a hard thing to do if only one of them is actually compliant with the living building challenge. Um, most universities have standards, right? And uh, at Georgia Tech, we spent a lot of time working with their university, with their campus standards. They affectionately call the yellow book. The yellow book has a lot of things in it that do not mesh well with, uh, with the materials pedal. The, the biggest one, to sort of at the highest level, is there's a prohibition on using wood as a structural material on campus. As you can see, we decided not to follow that one. Um, so. Um, uh, the other thing is frequently these buildings are very, very high profile. Uh, our presence here tonight with respect to the Candida building is evidence of that, as well as other press that the project is getting. And so these projects are highly scrutinized. They, can, they have a tendency to be under a microscope. And that means that uh, you know, other people are asking questions. Um, in the case of Georgia Tech and the Candida building, we had a senior vice president for, um, for finance in almost every design meeting. And that is really, really unusual. That's very high level involvement drilling down into a building level. Um, 
rendering of the, of the porch as you look out there. Um, we used a number of tools to make sure that the materials panel was captured as we went through this. Uh, there are a lot of online tools, databases, and these things. Uh, some of them are really good. Some of them are less good. I'm not going to pass judgment on which ones are which. Um, but the reality of it is that there is no one overarching database or tool out there that you can use to get to pedal uh, certification in terms of the materials pedal. There's just, it, it doesn't exist. There's always independent research. There's always something else you've got to do. Um, it was really, really important. Larry mentioned a, a whole team. And in this case, that whole team includes a contractor. Uh, without the general contractor on board very early to both buy into these concepts, but also to be able to, to contribute and help us vet materials. Uh, there are certain things that the design team just can't do. Um, getting mill certificates from steel mills before you buy the steel is really, really difficult unless you're the contractor and you're saying, I'm going to buy this from you. Can you please give me the mill certificate? And so there's a lot to, to go in that. Um, we completely rewrote our Division I specifications, which is really important in terms of establishing the rules of the road and how the contractor has to engage the site and the living building challenge and the owner and the other pieces of the puzzle. Um, and then we have specific specification language as well. And then really important, we sort of invented this two-step submittal process uh, where we're asking for most submittals with materials twice, once for specification performance and once for red list conformance. And so, and then we have a side committee that's reviewing the red list conformance piece. Um, so the red list gets most of the attention in terms of the materials pedal. Uh, it, it looks complicated because it is, um, but from these approximately 20 different classes of chemical, what you get is about 800 different individual chemical compounds that we have to figure out and validate that are not in the building. Um, I will say there are lots of exceptions and, uh, and idiosyncrasies and twists and turns as you go through there, um, but, but that's, the, that's the gist of it. To try to solve that problem, we actually created during the design process, very, very early on, what we called the materials working group. And so that was members of the design team from specific disciplines, uh, from the contractor and from Candida as well, experts from all over, to try to figure out how to set us on a path that would ensure success in terms of writing those Division I specs and going through those processes. Um, so everyone was, was, was represented. Um, we had monthly meetings. Uh, we, we, uh, we ended up adding the owner to this. Georgia Tech wants to use the building as a way to grow their own standards, and so uh, involving the, the, the client very closely as we go through this process was really important so that the campus standards could evolve. And Maria at Georgia Tech has sort of been designated their materials expert, so she worked with us through this as well. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then we tried to figure out how to split the vetting, because if you think about a building, a building has several thousand products in it that you have to build the building from. And every one of those, unless it's a completely natural material, like say a piece of wood, has to be vetted. The manufacturer has to tell us what's in that product. And so this was the flow diagram that we decided to use, uh, that we created for this project to figure out whether we should be specifying a product or not. It looks complicated. It is complicated. There are incentives elsewhere in the Living Building Challenge Program that say, and when we get to salvage materials, we'll talk about it a little bit more, and say, well, you don't actually have to vet things that are salvaged or reclaimed or reused from someplace else. So anything we could do to not have to go through this process during the, uh, during the design was really, really helpful. Um, so this story gets a, gets a, lot, of, um, a, a lot of press. This was um, during the, the Bullet Center construction in Seattle. Prosoco was asked to reformulate their weatherproofing system on the skin. And so they did that, and everyone is, is, is great. That's, that's awesome. Um, the manufacturer responded. Um, here you can see that same system being used uh, on the Candida building. This is from our live webcam. This is from yesterday afternoon, actually, where you can start to see the western facade coming together and that product being applied. Well, they reformulated the product, which is fantastic. They did exactly what the design team asked. But part of the point of this is market transformation. And so we're in the middle now where design teams a couple of years ago sent out a letter to manufacturers and said, please consider reformulating this. And a lot of manufacturers did. There's a letter now that's been written from what are called the Living Product 50. There's 50 manufacturers that have written a letter back to the design community. And they've said, 
we need your help. We've done what you've asked. We've reformulated products. We've gone through this exercise. And now we have this problem, which is they're not necessarily seeing or understanding that they're getting specified more or that they're getting business from it. And in some cases, they're actually struggling to justify the investment they've put to reformulate their products back into this. So it's really important we're trying to create a dialogue here and complete market transformation. And that does not mean design teams go out and say, give me this, give me this, give me this. That we, we owe the manufacturers a certain level of duty to go back and look at what they've done and to try to, at the very least, explain why their products aren't being specified or if they are specified, why they aren't being selected. Because obviously they still have to be cost competitive and all the other challenges that I talked earlier about public procurement processes and these things. So, but just wanted to raise that as an issue that this is a, this is a dialogue, it's ongoing. Uh, the, um, Living Futures Conference that was, that was mentioned earlier uh, usually has sessions about this and, and, and tries to continue to improve this dialogue. Um, it's awesome to come to a presentation and show screenshots from our specifications, right? <laughs> <laughs> so just as an example, this is a, a shot from our specs where you can see every spec section had living building challenge requirements for the red list and then other components that were very specific to that product and, the, and those pieces of the puzzle. So it's important that, that this stuff gets worked in, right? It's a broad abstract thing, but it's also a very specific, very concrete thing. Um, and we'll leave the red list there because to go much further is to delve into chemistry and I'm not a chemist and we don't necessarily need to go there. Um, I think everyone understands why removing toxic chemicals from building products is important. Um, so let's talk about embodied carbon footprint. This is actually, um, in, in, in my world, this is, this is actually the next big, um, big thing. So when we get to net positive energy in terms of operational energy, what we're talking about is that the building won't create any additional carbon through its operations. But the issue is the building is already built and it's there and the carbon it took for the concrete and the steel and the carpet and the glass and the curtain walls and all the other parts of the building are already there and they're in place and that carbon has already been put in the atmosphere when the doors open and depending on how the building is built and what it's built out of some buildings can take 50 to 100 years to pay back to get to carbon neutral if they're operating at carbon neutral and so it's very important that we start to understand the potential of this. Um, to me, when you start to think about this, you can think about it almost like a 401k or a reverse investment, right? So if you invest early and often, you can get big returns on the back end. This is, this is, this is the same thing, but in sort of backwards, right? So the more we can pull out of the atmosphere now, embodied carbon is a huge piece of this, the less we have to take out 50 to 100 years from now in order to prevent more catastrophic climate change. So this is a, this is a very important concept. Um, so this project's in Georgia. We live in Georgia. Um, Georgia has a lot of land that have a lot of trees on it. They actually have more commercially available logging um, land than, than any other state, which is pretty amazing. Um, so the timber industry is, is, a, is, a, is a big deal. Um, wood is, is, is it's, it's natural. And so part of this is about the economy as well as about buildings, right? So we want to support that economy. Um, so you start to understand building materials and the biggest part of embodied carbon on most buildings is the structure itself, right? Because that's the most mass in a building. And so you start to see here, this is the embodied con um, carbon in, uh, in steel, embodied carbon in concrete, and that, that little guy on the bottom, that's wood. And so what you see is that wood has an extremely low embodied carbon rate and if it's harvested locally, and it's harvested sustainably, that number can actually be negative. So buildings built out of mass timber can actually be carbon sequestration tools. And that's a really important part of this, uh, of this building as well. Um, so we looked at, we, we did all of our due diligence. We looked at different systems. We explored how to build the building with different structural systems. And in the end, we ended up with a, with a predominantly wood building. Uh, we do have steel where we need it. And we do uh, on the outside to hold the PV array up. And we do have concrete where we need it at the, at the foundations. Um, no one has yet found wood foundations in Georgia to be successful. Um, doesn't mean it's not coming, but it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't been good so far. So um, this is a quick diagram of our, uh, of our structural concept. Uh, it's a beautiful sketch for our, our colleagues at Miller Hall. And what we realized pretty quickly, though, was that these beams, if they were pure wood, 
would have been three or four feet deep, and the, the, the mass of the building, it would have just felt really heavy. It would not have looked very good. And so we decided to use a little bit of steel in that system where steel is really valuable. We have three quarter inch diameter steel rods that run along to create these members that give this truss a lot more depth, but allow the steel to work where it wants to work, which is in tension, which is, is where it's very, very strong, and we're using very little of it and, and using it intelligently. Um, Responsible industry is a really important part of, uh, of the materials pedal. And so <clears throat> in this case, this has to do with making sure that when we extract things like wood from forest, that we're doing it in a responsible way and that we're being smart about it. Um, the Declare label is a, is a part of this. And so Declare is a, um, it, it's an online database, but it's also a program run by ILFI. And so this is slightly self-serving, but in a good way in terms of the requirement to use Declare products. So ILFI have said, if, you're, if you want Living Building Challenge certification, you need to use a certain number of our, of our Declare labeled products. Um, and what Declare does is it's a nutrition label. Here, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's a nutrition label for building products. So if you go to buy Ben and Jerry's, you can see how much fat's in it. You can see how much sugar's in it. And then you go, wow, I really don't think I want that anymore. Um, and then you say, you know what, nah, I, I'll do it anyway, and you, and you get it. Um, so the idea behind Declare is that it doesn't require us to go to these manufacturers and to say, hey, can you tell me what's in your products? And then they tell us. And then they say, well, but this 10% is proprietary. Well, we need to know everything in the product. Can you please tell us that? And you go back and forth a couple of times, and then you finally get to the right person, and they're happy to share it with you. And, and so this is a way to sidestep that process. And, and to have it done in advance. So manufacturers buy into this program, and then they, uh, ILFI vets the products, uh, and then we have access to this information directly um, on, the, on the website. Uh, the other big piece of responsible industry is FSC certified wood. Um, this one uh, this is one of those issues that's, that's pretty hard in Georgia. Um, uh, the Georgia State Legislature uh, some years ago said that no state funding can be used for projects that have third-party certification systems for wood. This is the power of the timber industry in Georgia, which we're actually trying to support, right? We want to buy local wood. We want to use their wood. And what happens is because FSC is a requirement for Living Building Challenge, we actually ended up having to buy our wood from outside of Georgia because the, uh, the forests in Georgia that are FSC are primarily growing trees for pulp and paper, which is also a big in part of the, uh, the lumber industry. Um, and so there's, there are more stories to that. But, um, so wanted to talk a little bit about FSC and sort of one of the things that can happen and how some of these things can come together. So this is the, the decking in the project. This is the nail laminated decking. There's a photograph of it and then some technical drawings of how we're using that with the wood. And one of the things we realized while we were going through this, this is sort of a salvaged and, a, and an FSC story, the, uh, all of these two by sixes, these pieces coming down here, they all have to be FSC certified because they're new wood. And in order to use wood in a building, it has to be new um, in all states except for Oregon. So go Oregon. Um, so you can't use salvage wood in a structural application without testing a certain percentage of it. That gets challenging. Uh, so what we decided to do when we were talking to our engineers and the rest of our team, we realized, hey, wait a minute. These two by sixes are doing all the work. These slots in between, those actually aren't structural. We don't need them to be structural. And so we can use salvaged wood for all of that. So 50% of our floors in the building are all salvaged wood. And so that means we're not worried about whether it was FSC or not, because when you use salvaged products, you don't have to worry about the red list, and you don't have to worry about FSC certification. And you can start to simplify that diagram that I showed before that we had to go through for vetting projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in a second. Um, so living economy, this one's fairly straightforward, right? This is, um, this is if, for those of you familiar with LEED, this is about buying products within a certain radius of the job site. Uh, and so here's a, here's a map, um, different percentages within different radii. We're lucky in the southeast, and this is true for Nashville as well, that this gives us access to the industrial uh, Midwest, which has a lot of products manufactured there. So it's, it's a... Uh, this is a relatively straightforward thing to achieve, and it just requires the contractor to keep track of where everything is being bought. Um, net positive waste. This, one, this one's my favorite. This is the one, this is the salvage materials one, um, but it also requires high, high levels of recycling 
in the in the construction process. So you can see uh, you can see specific components here. We're effectively trying to recycle 99% of construction waste um, during the construction process, which is extremely high, uh, and in some cases can be very very challenging. Um, rigid foam, you'll notice, is, is lower. Uh, we actually discovered that foam has zero recycling capacity in Atlanta. No one wants it. it. It is garbage in the eyes of everyone around. So we've started to try to figure out how on the job site we could take extra pieces of foam that are in weird shapes and triangles and cut and broken and how we can reuse them in, in pockets and cavities and other areas where we don't otherwise, uh, where we're trying to fill voids and instead of filling it with concrete, we're filling it with scraps of, uh, of this insulation. So, um, but this, uh, this imperative requires requires a management plan. And so this has to do with both construction and it also has to do with operations. And so part of this, uh, this waste management plan requires you, uh, as, as the owner afterwards, to go back and understand how you're going to manage waste. You have to have composting on site, recycling, um, and, and other facets of, of managing the building. So this applies not just to, um, not just to, the, uh, to, the, to the construction side. Back to the beautiful specifications that we wrote. Um, so one of the things to incorporate salvage materials, we had to write specs from scratch uh, that, that addressed salvage materials. One of the things that, that is challenging about reusing materials is if you're a designer and you're trying to say, I want to use reclaimed wood, the contractor is going to say, that's great. Where, where do I get this reclaimed wood from? And how much of it do I have? And do I have to mill it? And does it look like you want it to look? Because you're an architect and you're particular. And when we get done with it, you're going to tell me it doesn't look good enough. And so there's a whole dialogue about making sure that this works. And so we wrote specifications to try to, to, try to go through that. And we had, to, we, had to, we had to work closely with the contractor. We had to identify sources. In this case, we, um, we had to say, all right, Georgia Tech has trees that were taken down for safety reasons or for, for, for other um, or because they were diseased, and Georgia Tech has kept these. We have this many logs. We can go through that. And in the case, because the contractor was on board so early, they could go look at the logs with us. We had meetings standing around abandoned warehouses looking at logs, which is not something that most architects do on a daily basis, but it's kind of fun, actually. Um, and so we were able to figure out how to, how to make all this work. Um, in order to do this, though, to, to, to really take the next level, take it to the next level, you've got to have partners. And so the city of Atlanta has a place called the Lifecycle Building Center. And this is an institution that is dedicated to salvaging materials, bringing it to their warehouse, and then reselling it to the public, or in some cases, reselling it to a contractor. And so these guys were the partner in getting all of those two by fours that went into that floor. They were able to, uh, to source tens of thousands of linear feet of, of two by fours uh, so we could use them in the floor and, and avoid having them end up in a landfill. Um, I, I don't know, to my knowledge, Nashville does not have a, a, a similar organization, but, um, but for, for students who are interested in this, I would say this is not a financially rewarding career path, but it is a very fulfilling one. Um, and so this is so th this is where some of our lumber came from, uh, in, in from the floors. So Georgia has a, a booming television and film industry right now. They're really, they're, everybody's going crazy. Lots of stuff gets filmed. There's nothing either better or worse, depending on your perspective, of seeing the building across the street in that movie, and it just. There goes my willing suspension of disbelief because that's the High Museum, and you know I know that's not what that building is in Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so we're taking advantage of those movie sets, though. And so here's a, an example of a set that got taken down by the Lifecycle Building Center. They were able to palletize it, quantify it, store it in their warehouse, and then deliver it back to Skanska uh, when we needed it, when we needed to go build those, uh, those floor panels. Um, we have other reclaimed materials on this project. Um, and, and a lot of these, which is really great about this, this project, and, and I, would, I would hope that, that should Vanderbilt go down this road at this level, that, that similar stories would, would come out of that project as well. That, you know, things are happening all over campus. Uh, in this case, there was an older roof that was a slate 
tile roof. These roofs last hundreds of years, so they're great in terms of durability, but after slate has been in the sun for 150 years, it's not a really great building material anymore. It's very brittle. And so working again with the Lifecycle Building Center, we were able to actually get the contractor who was taking these off to replace the roof to palletize them, and then we are using that as our wet wall tiling in the restrooms in the Candida building. Um, this, this is another one. So uh, the Georgia Archives building uh, was taken down to make room for a new courthouse outside of downtown Atlanta. And there was a, a, a big nonprofit in Atlanta, South Face, has an annual dinner. And one day, at, at one year at that dinner, it was a couple years ago, someone came up to me and said, hey, we got we to talk, and grabbed a couple of contractors and grabbed our contractor and grabbed me. And they said, oh, we got to talk about it. The Georgia Archives building is coming down in three days. And there's this amazing stuff in that building. We've got to get some of that. And so at this dinner, huddled in the back corner, we figured out how to get these granite curbs that were in this building, salvage them, get them into Georgia Tech's warehouse, and so now we can use those uh, on our site in the building. And there are a couple other things that came out of this, uh, out of this project as well. So it's a, it was a, a great last minute thing. Um, another story, Georgia Tech decided they needed to put an emergency stair into an old building from, uh, from the 1880s. But when they took, cut the hole in the floor to put this new fire stair in, they had these amazing wood joists come out of the floor. They're about three inches thick and 20 feet long. This is wood that is just not available anymore unless you want to dive to the bottom of the Savannah River and go harvest pine out of it, which there are people that actually do that. Um, but it's very expensive. So we were able to get this, and we are now able to reclaim uh, all this wood and are finishing it and are using it as our stair treads in the atrium in the building. And so as you walk up the, in the building, you get these pieces of Georgia Tech history as they, as they came out of these old buildings. So we're, we're trying to really create a circular economy here, right? Take things that are coming out and re find purpose for them. Um, these are some of the logs I was mentioning earlier that we got to, to, to stand around and analyze. And it is, it's pretty hard to, to, to see this potential sometimes as you look at piles of, of logs and think, ah, I don't know, is it rotted? Is it going to work? Um, but working with Scansil, we were able to get it milled. And because they were on board so early, they were able to actually air dry it for about 18 months before we had to send it back up. Right now, it's at the cabinet maker's shop, and they're finishing it. And we're going to end up using it as a series of live edge countertops throughout the atrium to really show off the specialness of that wood. This slide again. Um, I think I told all the stories associated with this one already, but, um, but again, see how the, the new and the old are, are, are coming together. Um, so here we have those, those same uh, nail laminated panels. They're about 10 and a half feet long, and they're five feet wide. And the only way to make them work with that fluted pattern is you've got to build them upside down. So that way you can get the, uh, get the pieces aligned. Well, what Skanska did is they decided that they couldn't find a subcontractor who was willing to do this. And they said, you know what? We're going to build them ourselves. And so they decided to build them. And you can see here a group of guys in the warehouse. They set up a jig, and they were able to build this. There are 489 of these panels in the building that they had to prefabricate. Uh, the warehouse, fortunately, is only about a mile and a half from the job site. So there wasn't a, a long distance to, to haul them. Um, but one of the things that we're, we're trying to do here um, in thinking holistically, again, is understanding the equity pedal. And so going beyond the, the minimum requirements of the equity pedal, Skanska saw the opportunity to work with a local nonprofit called Georgia Works, which helps homeless men find a skill and then take that skill to go to get a job and to, to sort of get them up out of poverty. And so Skanska put an experienced superintendent and hired four guys through the Georgia Works program to build these nail laminated panels. And so again, in, we're, we've got FSC, we've got salvage materials, and now we've got a great equity component as well as we help the neighborhood. And we're not just building an ivory tower um, that, that intimidates people. Um, one, of, one of my favorite pieces here, those panels are 10 and a half feet long. Well, wood only comes in 8, 10, and 12 foot lengths. and so. Uh, we had 18-inch chunks, uh, several thousand of them, as you can see here, uh, sitting around. And so we decided that we needed to reuse those. We can't, we can't get rid of them. And so we ended up putting those, um, oh, sorry. Uh, we ended up using those in the, in the atrium as the seat stairs. So when you walk into the atrium, we've got concrete floors, for most of it polished concrete. But when you drop down into the atrium, 
all of these guys are going to be fabricated into, uh, into those site stairs. And so even within the products that we have in the building, we're trying to use 100% of what we have. Um, and so this is the um, uh, a shot. And so here you can see the steel trusses that I mentioned. You can see the nail laminated panels in place. And, and that is the summation of the materials pedal. Um, I, I think the, uh, we, uh, the part four of making Nashville Living Building Ready, as, uh, as Keith had mentioned, is a tour scheduled for April 6th. Um, you, you, you will have the pleasure or the pain of listening to me walk you through the building firsthand on April 6th. And so uh, please uh, sign up and come. It'll be, it'll be great. And, and uh, we should do questions. Thank you. That was thunderous. I appreciate it. Uh, questions? They don't necessarily have to be about the materials, by the way, too. Anything you want? Yeah. Okay, so the, so the question was, how does maintenance deal with termites? And so it's funny, uh, one of the, the very senior people at Georgia Tech walked through the building with me about, about a month ago and asked me the same question. And so the, um, the answer is that termites are attracted to rotting wood, right? Moisture in buildings causes wood to rot, and that's what termites are, are attracted to, right? If you think about an ecosystem, termites are there to take trees and logs when they fall down and to decompose them and help accelerate that process. And so the way you avoid termites in a conventional project is the building industry in the southeast puts poison in the ground, and it kills everything in the ground to make sure that termites don't come out of the ground and mysteriously eat your concrete. I've never quite understood that as a practice. And so for this building, we did some research and we concluded that not only is the poison not necessary and not allowed on a living building project, um, but that it, it, it's, it's not the right solution. And so by intelligently detailing the building and making sure wood never touches the ground, right? All of our wood is, is, is elevated off the ground. Areas that are outside are actually steel structure and not wood. Uh, and then making sure that the roof and the other pieces are detailed properly so that we don't have moisture intrusion that then may, uh, may invite insects up are, 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 is, is, is our way to do it. So we're doing it through smart design instead of poison. And, and for, for what it's worth, because I got a skeptical look, not from you, but from the guy at Georgia Tech when we had that conversation about a month ago. Um, a personal touch, my house was built in 1951. I have no termite control. My house has no issues. And I have a granite foundation that comes up out of the ground, so none of the wood touches the ground. And then um, you put wood on top of that. And so that strategy in terms of detailing around it is, is viable, and it's, it, it's been done for, for some time. So. Okay, so the, the question was whether um, salvage materials were cost neutral, cost positive, cost negative, depending. And so I would say it's a mixed bag. There are certain things that were more, certain things that are less. Uh, one of the, the, the nail laminated decking that I was talking about, uh, we actually had significant challenges finding any subcontractor that was willing to even do that work. Um, we, we found one contractor in Vancouver that said, yeah, we could build that for you but we won't deal with salvage material and it doesn't make sense to ship you know 50,000 linear feet of two by fours that you just pulled out of a building saved from the landfill and ship it diagonally across North America and back again so uh, we, we, we had to find another way to do that in the end their bid for the project was about 120 150 percent of what Skanska ended up charging to self-perform that work so that's an example where it saved a significant amount of money. Um, I would say Skanska, if, if, if they were here, would tell you they lost their shirt on the dollar value they put on the GMP. They actually really underestimated how much labor it would take to build 489 of those panels. So 
the project saved some money, but the contractor didn't do well as a result of that. So kind of a mixed bag on that one. Um, I think the slate tiles are actually an example where we saved some money. Uh, we had a raw material. Uh, we had a number of ideas about how to reuse that slate. And one of the criterion that we used was how much does it cost? And what we found is that as you start to double, triple, and quadruple handle material, the price just keeps going up and up and up. And so the idea of taking the slate, we, we're making one cut on the slate, and we're cutting it into strips, and then we're putting it on the wall as tile, and that that saves the material cost of tile at whatever tile we would have specified, you know, nominally $10 a square foot. And so that was, that was a, a positive one. Um, I think some of the logs and the live edge wood that I showed some, issue, uh, some images of, those are going to cost more money than new wood. There's just, by the time you took the time to investigate the logs, make sure that they were right, figure out how to cut them. Some of them we actually, uh, you saw images of slab cut, but some of them were actually quarter sawn because we want live edges on the, on the roundness of the tree, not just on the edge of the slab of wood. And so that takes, uh, a, 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 you have to get that right. Then you've got to let it sit somewhere for 18 months. You may have to kiln dry it. You may not, depending on the weather, that particular 18-month period. And then you've got to get it to your mill worker shop who's got to finish it and test it, make sure they're comfortable with how much they have and how they're working it, and then they've got to ship it back to the job site. So I, I, that was cost neutral at best, probably more expensive in the end. Um, but it's a great part of the project, right? Georgia Tech had these logs sitting around, and it would have been, in our minds, negligent to not figure out a way to reuse these, uh, th these logs. And some of them are species that aren't commercially available anyway. Uh, we had a, a number of logs of, um, of black oak, which is, a, which is a pretty unusual species, but is absolutely durable enough to work with, and it's beautiful. And so that, that's, that's maybe a long-winded answer to your question. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, kind of tagging on to that. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. So how, how difficult it was it to work with traditional, uh, I guess, dumpster contractors instead of engineers? Yeah. So, uh, so the, um, the success of the slate tile salvage operation is due almost entirely to the Lifecycle Building Center. So what they went out, and that contractor was a separate contractor, right? It wasn't Skanska. And they went out. And, and Lifecycle went to the job site, and I said, okay, how are you taking those off the roof? And I said, oh, we're going to take it off, and we're going to, exactly as you said, we're going to chuck it over our shoulder, it's going to land in a bin, and it's going to shatter. And so Lifecycle built these crates that were, si they were custom built and sized such that they would fit in the lift that the people removing the slate tiles uh, could use. So they could take it, instead of chucking it or dropping it, they could just set it in the bin right next to them. And I think we ended up with 14 or 15 of those bins full of slate tiles. Um, and then, and then to, you know, to make it a viable business, then the, the project, Skanska, bought those crates and the tiles from the Lifecycle Building Center at whatever it cost them to build the crates and, and, and go through that, um, plus, plus a, a, a small profit. So. Uh, the contractor that was doing the demo, actually, it was a, I would argue it was a cost savings because they didn't have any tipping fees for the, for the dumpsters that didn't get used. But they would argue it was cost neutral because we didn't change the process, right? Their, their take it off the roof, put it in a bin was the same as take it off the roof and put it in a dumpster. And so we were able to, to, to make it so they had no direct cost. Um, like I said, if I were Georgia Tech, I'd have said, well, hey, we're saving you the tipping fees. You should have giving us a small credit. I don't know if that happened or not. So, yeah. Um, it sounds like there was a decent amount of legal research involved in this product. Who did you work on with that? Was that like university lawyers or for your firm? Uh, so, so, so your question is um, there a lot of legal research? Yeah, with the different um, statutes that you had to abide by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, we did a lot of research. Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't qualify very much of it as legal research. Uh, some of it was probably digging into certain components that might have crossed into that. I think uh, the water pedal is probably the one that's, that's the most legalistic in terms of what it was. EPA has very strict rules and, and, and laws about the Clean Water Act and what water can have, and, and going through that process and getting them to allow us to drink rainwater, um, which I have an update for that, but we can talk about that later. It's a whole other story. Um, but <laughs> uh, but that, that was probably the, 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 the most legalistic part of it. I think the, um, the, like the, the stories about Oregon, for example, um, that, yeah, we, I don't remember specifically researching it, but somewhere along the lines, we, we, we realized that you're not allowed to reuse wood uh, without having to test a certain percentage of it to prove that it's still structurally viable. And so, but that, that was sort of the extent of it. it. It didn't go beyond that in terms of legal. Did I, did I answer your question or do you have a follow up? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so the, the kind of the follow-up was about authorities having jurisdiction, and if we have in-house attorneys, and how how that part of the process works. And so, we do not have in-house attorneys. Um, the closest thing we have to an in-house attorney is uh, is Tony Eck, whose wife sits on the federal appellate court. Um, <laughs> so, I don't think I don't think I don't think that one counts. Um, so, uh, and the, the next best option is me, who's got too many lawyers in my family. Um, but uh, the, the, the reality of it is that most of the laws and restrictions around building revolve around authorities having jurisdiction, which is what the building code, right? So a, a municipality adopts a building code. That building code gets treated as sort of the rule of the land, the law of the land. But there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of ambiguity. And so building departments and inspectors have a certain level of authority and a certain level of, um, of, of interpretation is required to, to go through most of these processes. And so uh, we, we worked very closely with the, with the fire marshal for the campus, uh, a, a gentleman named Larry Lobby, who without his involvement from the very beginning, we would never have been able, for example, to get the open atrium that you saw. Um, that, that's, that is not strictly in line with the prescriptive requirements of the building code, but it is in the performance-based de demonstration of code compliance. And so that requires working with AHJ and ha doing special analysis and, and going through that process. So, yeah. What's, uh, where did you get your composting product from? And when did the health department declare that you could use it? Uh, so the question was about composting toilets, when we got them and when we were told it was OK to use them. Uh, I'll, a I'll answer the second one first. So we, were, we went to a meeting with the city of Atlanta, with the Georgia State Environmental Protection Division, and I want to say there was someone else there. Maybe the EPA was at that meeting. Um, well, so the question is not a health department issue in Fulton County in Atlanta. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a city issue. But here's the, here's the fun part. Because this is a state project on state land, the city actually doesn't have jurisdiction. The state has jurisdiction. And so that's why the Environmental Protection Division is the group we actually ended up working with the most. And in terms of composting toilets, the city said, Georgia Tech, are you sure you want to do this? And Georgia Tech said, absolutely. And then they looked at me and said, do you have experience with this? We said, yes. The city of Atlanta approved one in 2005 at the South Face Institute that we happened to design. And they said, and there was a, a gentleman in the back with a very long white beard who said, yeah, I, I, I approved that one. It's OK. <laughs> and, that was, and that was the end of it. We, we did not talk about compost and toilets again after that. It was just, from that meeting on, it was a given. And that was pretty early in the design process. So um, in terms of whose we used, uh, there are basically two manufacturers out there that are viable for commercial application for compost toys, Phoenix and Clivus Molstrom. Uh, the project ended up with Clivus Molstrom. And there's a story behind that, too, but it's not worth going into, at least not now. Um, so all right, anyway, yeah. That's, 
Okay, so two questions. First one is about piping materials uh, for MEP systems, and the second one is about mitigating fire and natural disasters. So um, the, the first question about what piping we looked at. So most buildings will have pipes that are in multiple categories of, of product, right? So you have metal ones, and that's usually copper if it's potable system or if it's certain other types of things. Um, you'll have cast iron, which is usually used for drain lines, and both of those are, are, are standard and okay in living buildings, so for those types of systems, that's what we used. Uh, where we get into more trouble in the living building system is where you have either galvanized pipe, which is not a good material to be building with anyway, um, but so we're, so that, that was out to begin with, and then you get into plastics. And so PVC is on the red list directly. Um, if anyone wants to know why, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that question, but, but I won't do it right now. Um, but PVC is on the red list, very, very common building material. And so when we were writing our specs, people uh, who had systems that had a lot of plastic piping in them knew about it in advance and tried to talk to manufacturers or specified piping types other than PVC. So HDPE is, uh, is a favorite um, plastic substitute, and APS is another one. Now, APS piping is tricky. Some APS has small amounts of PVC in it, like in the 5% range, and so we can, uh, there's one manufacturer that will make a ABS without PVC, but they require a minimum order, and now we get into the idiosyncrasies of what is really required versus what exceptions might be in the material pedal, and, and you know, in the end, teams have to make the best decision they can that's reasonable based on what's in front of them, and buying 10,000 linear feet of extra pipe that the project doesn't need is not a reasonable decision that ILFI would expect us to make. So, that's. And then the second question about natural disasters and fire. Um, the project has a battery that's a part of the PV system, so it can function uh, as an, um, uh, to support the community in the event of a, of a broader scale natural disaster. Um, assuming that we follow through and the EPD allows us to follow through with drinking Rainwater, uh, the fact that there's a local potable source that's stored in the building is another way to mitigate against that. Um, and in terms of fire, the building has all modern codes in terms of sprinkler systems and fire alarm systems and, and, that, um, and that piece. And we did some um, computational fluid dynamic analysis of the model of the building to make sure that in the event of a fire, that smoke was, was, was not lingering longer than it should, et, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, the, the gist of it is, Wood burns in small pieces. Big chunks of wood don't really actually burn. Um, but that, that's the subject of a different lecture. <laughs> uh, yeah? So in thinking about all the select demolition and salvage and all of the man hours involved and stuff like that, um, man hours and labor cost earnings are so low. Have you, guys, have, have you guys ever thought about lobbying for higher fees or taxes for landfill um, stuff in landfill? Yeah. So the so the question was about um, was about trying to boost the salvage materials industry by lobbying for more expensive dumping uh, tipping fees at, at, at landfills, and um, so I would say that to get there as a as a society, we need all different people to contribute to solving the problem in all different ways, and that type of ad advocacy and and, um, and 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 requires political power, it requires a lot of other things, and I would encourage anyone who wants to go down that road to please do it. But until someone figures out how to make the planet slow and spinning so I have more than 24 hours in a day, I'm going to let that problem be, be, be you know, I'll let, I'll let someone else on the team you know, help us with that one. Um, but I think you're on to something in terms of helping salvage materials. Um, that's why a Portland Oregon is held out as the sort of shining example of this. Tipping fees in Portland are about four times what they are in Atlanta, and as a result, not the only result, but, but that definitely drives the salvage and reuse material market there. Um, you know, Atlanta has one life cycle building center and is a general population of about six million people. Portland, Oregon is about 2.2 million people, and they have six reuse centers comparable to the life cycle building center. So yes, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, in the back. I think it's safe to say that certain challenges are presented with competing in a living building project. So in terms of having a university as a client, would you say that the project was a success, such a success because of that, and or in spite of that, or maybe not much of, a, of an impact? Meaning, if there was a private client, could it have been as much of a success? Right. So 
So, so, the, so the question was about whether the, uh, the client type being a, a, a university impacted the success of, of living building um, challenge requirements. Um, since I'm being recorded, I'm going to plead the fifth. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think universities have a unique role to play in society, right? They, they can do things that don't necessarily have to be market driven, and that's really important. I think without that, you don't have the type of design research that we've been able to do on this project to help move the market. Um, so um, so um, it, it's, it's super important, that, um, and that's why Candida picked a university to do this and not a developer, for example. Well, the Bullet Center is a business case for the yeah, and, and the Bullet Center, yeah, um, the, is is a is a market rate building uh, office building in Seattle that was um, that's living building challenge certified, and it is it is the performer for that building gives market rate rents and um, and they were able to build it. Um, I don't know if in Atlanta that could be replicated, um, but I want to try. <laughs> Uh, so first question, uh, well, the second question was about cross-laminated timber plants in the southeast. What was the first question? Sorry. Keith. Just about where you the okay, yeah, and where, where the wood came from, particularly for the glue lamps. Sorry, apparently I've been up here for a while. Brain's starting to turn itself off. Um, so the, um, the glue lamps came from a company called Unilam. Um, we tried to get them to source most of their wood from the southeast uh, in FSC forests, so it ends up being... Alabama, Louisiana actually has quite a bit, um, and then they were they were fabricated in Florida and then trucked up to uh, up to the job site. So, uh, the in terms of the the, the second question, uh, cross laminated timber. Yes, there is a um, yeah. I'm really fading fast here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> there is a cross laminated timber plant in Dothan, Alabama that. Um, international beam built that I believe is open. It was supposed to open last fall. I don't know if it made it on time or not. And so for those of you that, that don't know, um, this building um, is a nail laminated timber building. And so all of those two by fours and two by sixes are put on a table and then nailed together. Cross laminated timber is where you take similar sized members, two by fours, two by sixes, and you lay them at 45 degrees to each other and you build them up in a series of layers and so you get effectively a, a slab of wood that, that acts structurally in both dimensions and that's a, um, and, they, and they come in different plies. It's almost like building plywood out of two by fours, it's kind of the, the way I think about it. Um, and that is, that is in terms of the future, I think in the southeast, that really is when we talk about mass timber, most people when they say mass timber are thinking CLT um, because it, it, it being able to, putting those plants in the southeast allows us to use southern yellow pine, which is quick growing, which, um, which, is, what mo which is most of what's grown uh, in, in the southeast anyway, and allows that to then go into the, 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 the billing industry. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting, um, but it's probably a nascent industry, but we're, we're getting there. Okay, so the question was if the wood was treated and if so, with what? Um, the, the first piece is the wood is not treated. We actually made a very conscious decision um, on the nail laminated decking in particular to not treat the wood. So that is raw um, two by fours. Um, in terms of the glue lambs, glue lambs, in order to make a glue laminated beam, you're gonna put it in a press with some glue and you're gonna put it under heat and pressure to get it to adhere to itself. And that process, requires a certain type of glue and there are no market substitutes right now that have redless compliant glue that, that actually lasts and so that right now does have some formaldehyde in it and there's actually an exception in the materials pedal specifically for glue laminated timbers. And, uh, but beyond that, they are, um, they're, they're, they're raw wood other than the, the glue. Um, and there was a sealer put on them when they were shipped to this job site but they're out in the weather for months at a time before the building gets closed in. Now that it's starting to get closed in, the glue lamb 
uh, sub is actually going around with, never thought I would see this, but a crew of guys with palm sanders sanding down the surface by hand of every beam in the building to clean them. Uh, and so but when it's done, it'll be, it'll be that raw, sanded, beautiful wood. So. Other questions? Before my brain turns completely off, apparently. <laughs> But, yeah. I understand that you have some challenges with the Georgia Tech design guidelines. Did you find that they modified them as a result of your conversations? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and we knew we knew going into the project that the the yellow book would be a challenge, and uh, our our agreement with Georgia Tech actually has language in it. Uh, normally, if you want to do something different than the yellow book standards, you have to write a letter and you have to explain it. You have to say, hey, we're going to deviate from your standards because of you know X Y Z. And you go through that process, and we uh, we actually have blanket permission in our agreement with Georgia Tech to not listen to the yellow book where it is in direct conflict with the Living Building Challenge, and we do not have to ask each time, which is a huge time saver unto itself. Um, and Georgia Tech is trying to take the building, and that was uh, Maria, who is involved in the Materials Committee, is trying to work with, with a group internally there to actually rewrite their, their yellow book standards and to remove things like PVC as a required material for uh, for electrical duct banks, for example, and to, to you know go to go to either ABS or HTPE piping instead. So, yeah. Um, you've already covered the energy stuff, but from a materials perspective, with your solar um, and some of the electrical components, I know a lot of the uh, manufacturers are moving towards obviously very sustainable mindsets and practices manufacturing. Um, did you have any any troubles? Uh, So, so the question was about uh, issues, potential issues associated with the PV panels uh, with respect to materials. Um, for the most part, it went pretty smoothly. You know, the, um, the, the structure, the superstructure that holds the, the array up is steel, and painting that steel with a, with a 50 to 100 year paint is what's required to, to, to do it right. And Tenemic, the paint manufacturer, actually went out and created a chart for us with all their products and listed every product that they made whether it was li red list compliant or not, and whether it was a good fit for this project and this application or not. And so they did, they, they were amazing to work with in terms of the steel pieces. Um, the racking the panels are directly mounted to are aluminum. And so we decided early on that all the aluminum in the project, including the curtain wall, would either be clear anodized, so it has no finish on it, or it would be mill finished. And so the curtain wall is clear anodized. The the, bra the all the racking is um, is mill finished aluminum. So it's just it's raw aluminum. And then in, in the climate in Georgia, it won't it won't chalk for hundreds of years. So uh, the long the lifespan of the panels will outlive the well, will, will, is shorter than the lifespan of the metal in that case. Um, and then the panels themselves are um, are always interesting because it's basically glass and silicone, but there's, there are wires and other things. Um, most of those wires usually have PVC insulation on them, and there are exceptions in the materials pedal for small electronic components where, uh, where PVC uh, insulation on wiring is, is allowed. And so we were able to make that work. Um, the, the PV that you saw in those panels, unfortunately, is actually not the final panel we ended up with. Um, through the, at the very end of the design process, uh, Georgia Tech decided that they wanted to change the panel to generate more power from the same surface area. So the panels that we had, uh, that you see in the renderings were, uh, were a, I think they were Trina, and they have a clear inner layer, and so that's why you get that nice dappled light effect, um, to, and they were about 18% efficient. The Georgia Tech really wanted to go to the sun power panels, which are 21% efficient, to just to generate that much more power for the campus. And it was compared to the cost of the system, it wasn't that much more expensive. And so the um, so the the Kukuloris effect with the dappled light was a uh, was a uh, sort of went away with with that. So so again, all all things considered holistic, right? It's designed. It's, yeah, it's um, water capturing. It's all those things. So yeah. A little more on that. So like uh, your panels are going to last a long time. Your your rack is obviously going to last a long time. Inverters um, nowadays are the lifespan is getting longer. Over the 
traditionally are the ones that we're pulling off now or a 10 year lifespan on the inverter, which is, the, you know, there's a lot of components in there that are not easily recyclable. Um, inverters nowadays are getting up 20 years and a little bit longer, but how is, how is that, I guess, O and M lifespan of that inverter being handled? Is, do you, are you having to source specific inverters or is this one of those exceptions that, you know, it is what it is, it's the market provides? And, yeah, so the question was about uh, about the inverters on the PV array and, and, and re recycling them at the end of life. And it's, it's considered a small electronic component. So, um, so, the, so the, the issues with recycling electronic waste are there, and, 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 and it's an exception in, in, at this point in the system. So, yeah? Just on that, do they consider an all DC building? Uh, so the question was, did we consider a DC building to get rid of the inverters? We actually did. Uh, we, we talked at the beginning about what it would take to create a DC building. And in the end, we decided that there just aren't enough products on the market right now. Um, I think at the time we had maybe three light fixtures to choose from that, that would run directly on, on, on DC. And what you end up with is, would any of those three meet the red list? And, right, and so you start asking these other questions and, and, and then do they look good? What's their, what's their lumen output? How efficient are they? Um, how much more energy do they use? I mean, you know, it's, it's, you get all these laundry list of questions you've got to follow up. And so we decided that this was not the building for that type of experimentation. It's a little too big. It's a little too complex. Um, but the, the future is out there. And I think with a smaller building, if someone could figure out how to experiment and get that off the ground, it's a great idea. You're welcome.